to you? Yes, looks great. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, well, it's uh, thanks for the invitation to give this talk. I think uh, uh, Yana and I were both asked and we got busy summer schedules and it just, she, she could have given it, I could have given it and we just decided to uh, do it together. And as a, uh, you know, longtime friends, that seems appropriate. Uh, we both got uh, interested in this topic because we both live in Northern California, uh, experienced a lot of destructive uh, wildfires and, and spent a lot of time wandering around these post-fire landscapes and wondered if we might be able to do something to, you know, fill the information gaps. And so uh, this, this is uh, an, an attempt to do so. And so our other authors on this uh, paper are Steve Quarles, who's retired from University of California Cooperative Extension, and Nels Johnson from the Pacific Southwest Research Station, who uh, did a lot of the statistical analyses for this work. So with that, um, just give a brief overview of uh, the talk. What I'm gonna, first of all, I'll just uh, spend a little time talking about the circumstances that led up to the campfire. And then uh, Yana will take over and, and talk about California's policies and strategies to mitigate home loss and the general factors that contribute to home loss. Uh, I'll come back and talk about study design and some key findings and uh, Yana will wrap it up. And so uh, as Crystal mentioned, uh, this is a paper uh, that we're gonna largely draw from uh, that was published late last year in the journal Fire Ecology. It's open access, so anyone who wants to download it can, can do so. Yeah, so uh, the, the campfire. Um, after living through the car fire, which burned into, into my hometown and watching a neighborhood catch on fire, um, it was all the more stunning just a few months later when we had the campfire, which had sort of an order of magnitude greater destruction is far and away the most destructive wildfire in California history, 85 people dying, you know, 18,000 structures destroyed. And a large portion of those structures were in the town of Paradise. Um, so the, the fire essentially crossed from one side of Paradise to the other over a period of six hours under very similar conditions and a strong uh, Northeast wind. And, and what this does is, is it eliminates some of the variables that you might other, otherwise see in, the, uh, in a post-fire uh, environment where fires burn under a, a lot of different conditions. And have, there's a lot of other factors that might contribute to home loss. But so as it was a very destructive event, but it was also an opportunity to learn so that we hopefully can avoid a repeating uh, similar um, catastrophe in the in the future. So the setup uh, to this was similar to a lot of our more destructive uh, wildfires in, in recent history, and and that was a dry fall uh, plus wind. And it's we've had th these um, delayed onset of, of fall precipitation in in several of the past years. And on top of it, you know, we're going through a, a period of drought. And so from this uh, illustration from Brewer and Clements, a 2019 paper, uh, you see that the, the entire Northern Sierra was, was in a pretty substantial pre precipitation departure from normal uh, at that time. Uh, and then, you know, we typically get fall winds. And when those fall winds happen without any precipitation, they become a real problem. And so there was a red flag warning uh, that, that uh, was in place on November 8th, the day of the campfire. And it, was, it predicted very strong uh, down canyon northeast winds that, that you know, flowed from the um, eastern California uh, through the Sierra. And just to give you a sense of the of how this wind interacted with the topography, um, this is the Feather River Canyon in the background on the left picture, and this is perfectly aligned with a uh, northeast wind, so it tends to be a wind funnel. And what happened is uh, I took these couple of pictures just a few months ago when I was up up here for another reason, 
um, but the fire essentially started in the canyon uh, back here, but then with that northeast wind, it blew up this this uh, Flea Creek, and you know crested the hill slope, and then um, raced off towards Paradise. This is the town of Concow here on the left. Uh, Paradise is up on this plateau, on this flat plateau on the ridge line, and what you notice in these in this picture is the the vegetation. And it obviously didn't look exactly like that before the fire. A lot of these, these dead snags uh, were probably uh, trees killed by a previous fire in 2008. And the trees here that have more intact crowns uh, were killed by the campfire. But it was a combination of a lot of dead wood in the system, both on the ground and snags and, and brush and um, the typical vegetation that grows in a productive area after after a uh, fire. So, so this became just an extreme, you know, wind-driven event with really high rates of spread. It, the fire started about six thirty in the morning, and by the time, you know, it, it was knocking on the door of paradise by about eight o'clock in the morning. So. In less than two hours, this fire had traveled approximately eight miles. And one of the things that made it really a challenge to suppress is by the time that fire reached Paradise, this flaming front here was about five miles wide. And it was throwing embers, sometimes miles in front of the fire. You can see this ember uh, ignition way out in front of the fire. Uh, and it was cutting off uh, evacuation routes, but it just made, uh, suppression of this fire is extremely difficult. And you, you can note on this, this image, uh, this was taken and processed by Zeke Lunder from Deer Creek Resources. I think it's an image from 1045 in the morning. And you can see all these little hot spots in the image and those are houses uh, burning. So in, in, in today's, um, so I'm, I'm going to then now t hand it over to uh, Yana, who's going to talk about uh, California's policies and strategies to mitigate home loss. Well, thank you, Eric. And it's a real pleasure to be with you all on the California Fire Science Consortium web webinar here. Um, <clears throat> Eric and I were noodling around in, in paradise trying to understand the event. And that's kind of where this, this project was hatched. And so it's a real pleasure to get to tag team with the two of us together because I think uh, he's awesome and has so much to share. So for context and in, in, in what started to drive this conversation, I'd like to just give us a little historical perspective on how we got to where we are from a, um, a fire mitigation strategy policy uh, perspective. So can you advance the slide, Eric? And, you know, I was just giving a webinar literally an hour ago to Oregon and starting to refresh on how we got to where we are in, in strategy around wildfire protection. And California is really at the forefront of this um, in the United States and has been working very diligently at it for a long time, um, really you know, stretching back to uh, 1965 with the development of a framing around defensible space around buildings. Um, you know, we're you know, keenly aware that fuel is an important contributor to, to fire spread and to um, you know, the mitigation of it is important to home defense. Um, and then, you know, in the 80s, we start identifying fire hazard severity zones. We're waiting right now for a new update to the fire hazard severity mapping. Um, so there's a continuing evolution in how we've thought about these issues. Um, and, you know, one of the really big game changers in policy was the 1991 tunnel fire, the Oakland Hills fire, which I was living in the Bay Area at the time. Um, it certainly was um, very significant in my own life, um, but it, it did a number of things. Um, you know, and it and it uh, contributed to how we think about who's responsible uh, for fire suppression. You know, really giving us a better sense of what the local jurisdictions are responsible for, uh, and then you know, setting the stage for expansion of defensible space standards out to 100 feet, so not just 30 feet, but 100 feet um, in perimeter around the home. Um, and then the piece that we were really curious about, um, which was triggered in that whole process and that whole framing of conversation is, what should we do uh, with hardening our homes and how do we make them more robust to wildfire exposure? So 
So in 2008 came the adoption of what's called uh, the Chapter 7A of the California Building Code, uh, which specifically looks at the wildland urban interface, and it deals with just the exterior component of the building. Um, and so what we see in paradise is an opportunity to really evaluate the effect of that code and did it make a difference because as perverse as this is, I mean, we had a very much a perfect experiment uh, in that, you know, we had a continuous burn period, we had um, suppression resources focused specifically on really trying to get people out of harm's way. Uh, and so most of the buildings had to survive on their own. And so it gives us the opportunity to kind of understand how those um, codes maybe are um, doing and, and what, what the opportunities are for improvement. We're now continuing to evolve in California. There's so much fire policy development, um, but what I'll just lead with is in 2020, the development of a new defensible space zone, which hasn't been rolled out yet. It's still in the regulatory process, but you know, California's a long, uh, a long evolution in thinking about um, where we build, how we build, how we manage fuels and who's responsible and, and now moving into that space around you know, new building construction and what should its standards be. So next slide, please. Um, and, and given that, you know, the majority of the focus in, I think, the public conversation, the educational conversation has been about mitigating uh, direct flame contact. Uh, so that's shown on the left where, you know, a hypothetical assumption that you've got uh, fire and, and a flaming front coming directly at the structure. And so how do you modify the fuels to either create a defendable space where you can put uh, resources to be able to protect the home? Um, or that you know the fire will, with with hope actually actually not will stop and and will will not touch the building, um, but we now understand uh, and and there's a lot more um, conversation around how do we uh, mitigate the exposures from embers, which you know Eric showed in that long distance transport element, which embers can you know penetrate buildings by open windows, they can go through porous vents, they can land in gutters as illustrated there, or they can land at the they can run into the wall and then accumulate the base of the wall. Uh, and you might um, have combustible materials there, either vegetation or other stored materials that can create a direct flame contact exposure on the structure. And then the other piece is something we call radiant heat, which is heat transfer from either an adjacent building or vegetation, which is uh, hot enough to create a failure point, and as illustrated in this graphic, you know, one with uh, a window pane breakage. So, Using that as the framework, we approached uh, trying to understand what happened in paradise, uh, thinking about what the mechanisms of um, exposure are and the mechanisms of failure. So next, next slide, please. And if you, you know, are new to the subject, I just want to give you that sense of um, how um, how many embers a building might have to withstand, how they can find all the little nooks and crannies, and um, you know make it particularly challenging to have that envelope of the exterior structure, um, you know, how robust it is really affects uh, what the potential for addition is. So um, next slide. I love this, I have this new new image from source from the LA Times. You know, you can see the eddies, you can see the, the way that embers are transferred around and what that near to building combustibles really um, can, um, can cause significant vulnerabilities. So if we move along here, um, the other component, and I think you'll see this in some of our images coming forward specifically to Paradise is, you know, trying to understand well, what is that vegetation to building connection? And here's an example from South Lake Tahoe and the Angora fire. And, you know, what's striking to me is that it was not an interior fire from, uh, this is a wildfire, right? So how did this building um, fail? And what, what happened here? Why isn't the vegetation involved? Well, it's very likely that there were embers that penetrated uh, some element of the building and created inside the building or adjacent to the building. And so often, you know, people are in a post-fire context wondering, well, what happened? What, why wasn't there, you know, a continuous flaming front that, that took this building out? So as we start to sort of detangle those mechanisms, um, it gives us some insight into where there are more opportunities for improvement in our, um, in our built environment and how we manage fuels. So next, Eric. So within each of the each of our structures, there are um, 
points that are more vulnerable than others. And so, uh, you know, being aware about like uh, a roof to wall intersection where, you know, the roof is class A and is designed to manage a fire exposure, but the wall as shown in that dormer there is not. And so um, those intersection points where they often accumulate debris are vulnerable locations, as are the roof edge where we use gutters to, to manage the water load and exposure to the sides of the buildings, which you know, we, we don't want rotten deterioration in the lower half of the wall. Uh, and so the, the gutter is a really important uh, means to be able to manage that, but it's also a collection point for leaves and needles and other debris, uh, and it can catch embers. And so you can get gutter fires, uh, and then depending on how the roof edge is um, maintained or designed, you can get a fire that goes underneath that class A roof and, and can get you know, into the roof deck and then into the attic. Um, there's also this element of like fence to houses, you know, wooden fences are wonderful, uh, but they can also serve as a wick bringing fire uh, directly to an attached um, building, for example, as shown in that picture from um, Coffee Park in Santa Rosa. And then just to bring the point home about uh, vents, you know, vents are really important because they let hot moist air out and they create a circulation system to manage heat load. But um, most of our vents in our existing construction are um, vulnerable to ember penetration. And so the bottom two images are from inside a building. And uh, in the left image, we see a gable end vent. So at the end of the pointy part of the roof, and you can see embers that are moving through what would probably be quarter inch mesh screen uh, and the little squirrely yellow lines of those embers coming into the building. Um, so depending on what they find and if they find a receptive fuel bed, you can create ignition basically in the attic itself, and the home, like that one from Angora Fire, appears to burn from the inside out. Uh, the one on the right is just showing an under eave vent and sort of the same concept. So understanding these kinds of vulnerabilities were some of the framing that we used to think about this uh, project. And do I take this one? Yeah. Okay, so using that kind of um, perspective, we had three primary questions with this research project. So the first one was, did the proximity to nearby structures factor into the probability of survival? So it's a question looking at sort of density and community effect and kind of how, how, did, how does the interplay happen between buildings? Um, and then conversely, you know, what happens with the vegetation? Is, is the vegetation associated with the probability of survival? And, and how do we think about that? Um, and then the third question was, you know, what is the impact of this new adoption of a building code? Uh, Paradise had a number of homes, 142 of them specifically, that were built um, under these new standards. And did that have an improved odds of uh, building survival? Okay, so thanks, Yana. Um, so, so I'll introduce you to our uh, study design. Um, what we did is, is we obtained the um, assessor database from Butte County uh, for this area, and we decided to concentrate on single family homes. There was also a lot of mobile homes in this landscape, a lot of other structures, uh, but single family homes um, led to, you know, just, uh, is, is one subset of, of what uh, burned in, in the campfire. And so what we did is uh, we uh, coded homes into three time periods. And the last latter one, 2008 to 2018, were the homes built after the adop adoption of the building codes. We chose a similar 11 year period immediately prior to compare those uh, two periods, and then all the rest of homes, everything built before 1997. And within each of those time periods, we randomly selected 100 to 200 homes from each of those time periods, more in this 1997 period, because there were just so many of the homes in Paradise were built in that time period. And then we, uh, we linked the assessor parcel data with the damage inspection report that CAL FIRE produces. Uh, and then uh, coded each of the homes into uh, destroyed, damaged, or you know, or no impact surviving. And we considered the damaged homes to have survived because generally it was a pretty minor damage. The structure was intact. But one thing you see from the um, illustration of Paradise is that for each of these three time periods, uh, the homes are fairly evenly distributed across Paradise. So it's not like all the new homes were on one side of Paradise and all the old homes were on another, where there could be these confounding factors. And 
so what we, we did, we collected some pretty simple uh, variables. One for, we looked at uh, just imagery and looked at overstory cover of, of trees we could see from, from this imagery pre and post fire. And then we just visually estimated the canopy cover of overstory vegetation in a 30 meter circle and in a 100 meter circle uh, around each of the randomly selected homes. Uh, next, we <clears throat> estimated, we measured the distance uh, to the nearest destroyed structure from each of our randomly selected homes. And that might be, you know, a, an outbuilding, it could be a garage, it could be another house. We also counted the number of, of homes within this uh, 100 meter radius and the number of homes in that radius that burned. Uh, we got lot size from the assessor's database. And then we um, separated the homes into ones that would be categorized as occurring in the wildland urban interface, which according to um, uh, a, a definition by Rattleoff and et al, uh, you know, higher housing density areas um, that are in proximity to an area of wildland vegetation, whereas wildland urban intermix areas are houses that are at lower density, but are, but are uh, placed like within the uh, vegetation, wildland vegetation matrix. And then we calculated slope is just the between, difference between the high and low point in this 100 meter radius circle. So um, when we just when we compiled the data for all of Paradise, uh, we could see that there was, a, there was an effect of home age. Uh, this graph shows the percent survived uh, for homes built in different uh, decades, and then the, and then the two uh, periods uh, before and after that um, update to the building code, um, it being these last two columns. So, um, yeah, I mean, obviously the newer homes did better, uh, but one of the things that you'll also note from this graph is on over the top of all of these columns. We have the number of homes built in that time period. And so a lot of the housing stock in Paradise um, was built in you know, before 1950 to about 1990 and, and lesser construction in the period since. So it's, it's a uh, pretty old, old, you know, just on the old side. And, and over time, you know, maintenance issues become a factor. And so when, when we walk through um, Paradise, we, we looked at what other variables might be confounded with this difference over time. And, and this just illustrates some of those variables. Lot size tended to be um, newer homes built on somewhat larger lot sizes. Canopy cover within 30 meters of the house tended to be lower for newer construction. And that's expected when, when a new house is newly built, um, trees tend to get cut down. It takes a while for that vegetation to regrow, but canopy cover 30 to 100 meters uh, distance was also uh, somewhat less for newer homes. Structures built within 100 meters or housing density was less for newer homes. And that's partly because the lot size was bigger, but partly also because over time, uh, there's a tendency to add more structures to property, outbuildings, uh, mobile homes, other things. And then slope was somewhat greater for the newer homes, but slope overall was, was pretty mild in a lot of the paradise landscape. As you saw from the picture, it's on top of a plateau. So to really understand what's going on here, you have to put all the, these variables in a model. And so the, this is just a, a list of these models, construction time period, year built within that con these construction time periods, distance to nearest destroyed structure, total structures destroyed within hundred meters, canopy cover at two different radii that while on intermix and interface uh, slope and all of these variables um, interacting with construction time period. And what we found um, in our final model is uh, all the variables on the on this upper part of the graph were significant. And the variables shown in red were the ones that had the strongest effect. And you can see that construction time period uh, was, was a definite factor as, as you would expect from that last figure. 
Uh, but two variables that, that were quite uh, important were distance to nearest destroyed structure and total structures destroyed within 100 meters. Uh, but also vegetation was important. Uh, 30 to 100 meters uh, that far out from the home, but also uh, in the 30, zero to 30 meter zone in some time periods, not in all time periods. And I'll show you the uh, graphs for that in a sec. Um, and so year built didn't add anything else. Um, I guess these three construction time periods captured a lot, most of the variation in, in contributed by year built and slope was also not a, not a factor in the model. Uh, this, this graph here, uh, these, this graphics basically come straight from our um, paper. And just to show you how this is laid out, each of these columns are the three time periods. The, on the left, these are all before 1997. The middle one is 1997 to 2007, the latter 2008 to 2018. And the first of, of the um, series of graphs is distance to nearest destroyed structure. And you can see that um, for homes built prior to 1997, there really was not, not a fact of distance to nearest destroyed structure. But for the newer homes, it was a very strong effect. And you know, why might that be? You know, one of the reasons we came up with is, I mean, it's possible that these older homes had other vulnerabilities and were maybe more easily ignited by embers, whereas the newer homes were more ember resistant, perhaps due to the construction or newness. And so the distance to the nearest destroyed structure became more of a factor in whether they were lost or not. Similar to a number of destroyed structures within 100 meters, the two newest, uh, the two uh, yeah, newest home time periods um, had the strongest effect with probability of survival being um, much reduced if you had a lot of structures destroyed within 100 meters. And then, but then vegetation was also important. Zero to 30 meters was important for uh, the, the last two time periods. Again, not for the uh, first time period. And that may be for similar reasons. There was other vulnerabilities besides vegetation, or just there's just so much variation in, in this uh, zero to 30 meter zone, which over time people construct landscaping, uh, lawns. Um, so there's a lot of variation uh, that, that contributes to that factor. And then for all time periods, uh, 30 to 100 meters was, uh, there was a, a strong relationship with probability of survival with, you know, if, if you have, uh, you have much higher survival when, when the canopy cover both, in, both near the home and farther away from the home is low. So another thing that was uh, interesting is, you know, the wildland urban interface variable. It wasn't the strongest variable in our model, but I, I'm showing this here because I, there was a, there was uh, one factor uh, that intrigued me, and that, you know, we, we've typically thought of uh, the way to protect a home from wildfire is to manage the vegetation around the home, defensible space. And so this is uh, the one the picture on the right shows a wildland urban inter intermix type of arrangement. And the one on the left shows an interface type of arrangement with denser housing, but in proximity to wildland vegetation. Uh, with, the, with the idea that you know, our, our threat comes from the wildland vegetation, one would tend to expect that this kind of a housing arrangement would be more vulnerable to a wildfire. Yet when we analyzed our data, we found that survival for this intermix was 29%, whereas homes that were in this interface type of arrangement were only was only 16%. Neither of them are very high, and so I, I think you know obviously from the uh, so the analysis it showed that both variables were important, but it gives some perspective. It's not just vegetation; it's also the distance to uh, destroyed homes matters. Uh, and you can see that the variable that was really different between this interface and intermix type of development was the distance to nearest destroyed structure, 11 meters in this type of development and uh, 24 meters in, in this style of development. And so what we did is uh, kind of the last an analysis I'm gonna show you is, is um, decision tree. Um, 
and and what this shows is the survival probability uh, and what the decision tree analysis um, showed is that the variable that best distinguished between a surviving and destroyed home was this distance to nearest destroyed structure. And it created, it, it, it produced a, it, it gave us a threshold um, too, is that um, if you were more than 18 meters away from uh, a destroyed structure, your probability of survival was 35% versus if you were less than 18 meters from another destroyed structure, you we're all the way down about 6%. And unfortunately, 73.6% of the homes in paradise were less than 18 meters from another destroyed structure. So that was uh, definitely a factor. And then um, as you go down the decision tree, uh, the next variable of importance was canopy cover at the 30 to 100 meter distance with um, if you were had canopy cover less than 53%, uh, you had a 48% probability survival. And if it was greater than 53%, the survival dropped um, pretty substantially. So one of the variables we wanted to ask you know, in our studies, as Yana pointed out, well, this is one of our study questions, did the proximity to nearby destroyed structures factor in the probability of survival? For that first one, yes, we had that 18 meters threshold. The second question we wanted to answer was, did fuels associated with nearby vegetation factor in? And, uh, and this shows, yeah, yes, the, that too was an important predictor. Um, and then the third factor in the model or in the decision tree was if a home was home age, if it was built before or after 1973, you had a higher probability of survival was built before 1973, it was, uh, it was considerably lower. And then the last um, variable in the decision tree was slope. If it was on a lesser slope, the probability increased all the way to 73%. So 73% probability of survival. If your home was greater than 18 meters from a destroyed structure, if you had less than 53% canopy cover at a distance from the home, if it was newer, built before, after 1973, and if you were on lesser slopes. But you know, only 7.5% of the homes in paradise um, met all of those criteria. Or can I say something here? Sure. You know, I think one of the things that's interesting, you know, I've opened our talk with sort of sharing some of our framing issues and how we think about these issues. And what's really important with this decision tree analysis is that it removes all of our biases. It says from a statistical perspective, is it possible to find relationships here that are driving the process? And I think, you know, both of us really weren't sure whether you, we could make sense of, you know, the type of, ver type of information we had and whether, you know, in a continuous framework, if you could have some, you know, fundamental uh, trigger points where you see a different behavior. And so what's substantial about this decision tree is that it's really giving us very strong signatures and very clear uh, mechanisms as to when a threshold change happens. And, and it makes sense from some of our framing, but we didn't, you know, load this. It's telling us what, what is actually happening from a probabilistic and a mathematical relationship. Thanks, Yana. And then uh, why don't you just go straight into uh, our analysis of the Okay. Effect great. of building codes. Yeah, thank you. So our third question was really looking at the effect of chapter 7a and whether that was associated with an improved odds of survival. Um, and so, you know, Eric's already shown you that we get this, you know, this pattern of improvement uh, through time. Uh, the punchline really is that um, there wasn't a strong statistical difference between uh, the decade before the construction and the decade after the new adoption. Um, but if you look at it, I mean, I think it's like 42% uh, versus 39% or 36% on either side of that. The point being is that newer construction is faring considerably better than the older homes, which are only surviving at, I think it says they're 11%. So what is it about new construction that's working and what's doing well in that space? And this really wasn't a disappointment to me. It just said, there's more room for improvement and we're going in the right direction. 
Uh, and, you know, for context right now, we're seeing an update uh, to the, the California Building Code, and there's a lot of um, great minds putting in our data and other uh, post-fire studies and other uh, laboratory experiments to really get to something that's uh, even better than where we were just in 2008. So next, next slide. What I want to bring forward, though, is, is really this neighborhood effect. I think I'm really struck by the spatial arrangements that we see in Paradise. These are two images from Paradise. I didn't draw on them. Uh, the colors are from the fall senescence and the leaves uh, turning color. Um, and you know, I think when you just start to look at the patterns, you can see that if you keep a community together or a neighborhood and don't have a loss, then there's a stronger relationship and a stronger potential for that community to stay together. But once you lose one home, you get that home to home spread element, you get that, you know, more exposure to construction related embers, more radiant heat. Uh, and then as you know, shown here, like where the red arrows are, you can see how all these homes start to interplay off each other. Um, so it's, you know, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a double edged sword. I really want to empower people to think about what they can manage at their own scale. But I think this also says that we need to work together as a community and we need to figure out how we, um, how, you know, my building affects Eric's building. Now Eric's building affects my building and that, you know, we are all in this together um, and that we need to, you know, figure out where those who are least able, you know, how we might rally behind them and help them with their particular uh, challenges on their structures and their yards and their landscapes. So um, what we also did for, for this analysis is, is we looked at some more of the uh, CAL FIRE DINS data. And uh, what CAL FIRE does is, is they take photographs of not only the destroyed homes, but the damaged homes. And we figured we could learn something um, from that. And when we looked at these pictures, we realized that uh, really they, they showed some of the same uh, elements of, you know, the. The, the mechanisms for uh, why homes uh, were vulnerable uh, in paradise. And in recognizing here that homes that were damaged may, uh, may have different mechanisms uh, involved than homes that were destroyed. We just, the evidence is gone for the homes that were destroyed, but I think it's still useful. Um, but, you know, we showed that nearby um, homes burning were a major variable and that burning of a nearby home produces a lot of radiant heat. And what, when, we, when we looked at all these pictures, we uh, looked at the, you know, here we sum the percentage of damaged homes that, that suffered from these different fire damage causes and radiant heat was the, was the dominant mechanism. Uh, the second one was flame uh, impact, flame contact from indirect ember ignition. And um, I'm gonna, just point out some of some of these effects here. Radiant heat, you can see the siding, the vinyl siding on this home is melted um, and it has a pretty low melting temperature. But also on the roof here, it looks like there were, um, you know, litter had gathered on this roof that caught fire because of an ember. Uh, this uh, home on the on the right shows classic radiant heat damage. Uh, will, windows are the most vulnerable point. Oftentimes a window would be broken or, or, or wall uh, affected, paint bubbling, et cetera. There, this, area, this home may have had a continuity of fuels with the wildland vegetation, but as you noted from the summary, most of the damaged homes did not really show evidence of, of uh, fuel continuity with the wildlands. And then this other picture shows what could be a direct ember ignition to, to a board here. It could also be an indirect ember ignition. You could see some signs that uh, there was maybe a gutter fire from this discoloration here and that gutter fire then maybe transferred into the eave here. Uh, and this picture on the, on the uh, right shows um, indirect, um, you know, flame contact from indirect ember ignition. There, there's, there's, lack of fuel continuity with the wildlands, but an ember apparently got into uh, the um, this planter and, and uh, ignited perhaps the fuels around the house. And a, and a lot of these pictures also show that, that you know, the effect of vegetation was, was in probably many cases indirect. You know, it wasn't necessarily the tree catching fire. It was a lot of times the vegetation or, or the fuels from that tree, the litter that collected in the beds of, of uh, uh, next adjacent to houses or in gutters that caught fire. 
The second graph shows the damage, fire damage location. And that also is indicative of radiant heat where the, the, the areas that showed the uh, damage the most were the windows and exterior walls. Secondly, eaves, roofs, and gutters were, were the second um, you know, group of factors with uh, other ones included uh, decks and stairs, attached fencing, and, and other and undetermined categories. But just uh, because I, I feel like a picture tells a thousand words, I just, I, I like to put as many of these as I can in a, in a uh, presentation. But this just shows some, some of the causes. Here's a fence that, that burned, that uh, burning fence then transferred into the eave. Luckily, the house didn't catch fire. Here's near home vegetation uh, with that fire then moving to the eave. Doesn't look to be a good idea to plant juniper next to your house. There was a lot of examples of, of uh, pictures with, uh, with juniper that didn't fare that well. Uh, here's a wall to window, classic radiant heat damage. Uh, this one on the lower left, bark mulch um, caught fire and that transferred to the wall. Uh, here's an example of a gutter fire. You can see the discoloration in the gutter or down here, a, near home just stored flammables uh, next to a home that were ignited by an ember and that transferred into the eave. So I'm gonna now turn it over to Iana. Uh, okay, great. I know we're coming up on time here. So just got a couple more slides here to sort of wrap up what we think this all means. So in, you know, looking at the vegetation and the vegetation management framing, um, you know, so what we saw in this study in this particular environment, it's a, a landscape where you see ponderosa pine and California black oak uh, fairly ubiquitous across um, much of the area where the homes are built. Um, we saw higher survival associated with a lower overstory tree cover. Um, and that the, those trees and why, why we think that is a contributing factor is that trees drop debris, leaves, needles, litter, et cetera. And here's an image uh, taken around the same time of year, just uh, in 2021. And you can see the debris collecting in the valley of the roof and around the home. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a maintenance factor and uh, with a high wind event, you're going to see a lot more of that vegetation come down as well. So, you know, there's, there's some challenges that come with that. Um, but one of the other interesting pieces that we saw was that we didn't see very much evidence of continuity with wildland fuels. So we didn't see essentially that relationship that you often would think about where the wildland fuels catch the house on fire. More we saw um, the impact on the surrounding vegetation when the house caught on fire. Um, so that's maybe a little different in some people's thinking. Um, the other thing that we want to point out, and, and this is in a time period in a, in, a, in a case in point here, it was done in, you know, in 2018, that how we thought about defensible space has really evolved since that time. Uh, so on the lower right, I'm illustrating where California is going with a three zone system now, um, really trying to mitigate uh, combustibles in the first five feet of homes. Well, that, that approach to defensible space was not implemented at the time. It was not in convention and standard practice. Um, and we think that that will likely have a big impact on building survival um, because of re, you know, removing both direct and indirect exposure opportunities. That being said, you know, a caveat, this is a project where we didn't have pre-fire conditions. Uh, we didn't have survey data of all the individual homes. We know the year they're constructed. We don't know anything more about the maintenance. We don't know exactly what siding type was where, unless uh, the home was only damaged and we can see that. Um, so, you know, there are limitations. We don't understand understory uh, conditions. We don't understand surface fuels. So there's more to the equation. It would be great to, to know all that um, and then have the opportunity to really test it in a real uh, live situation. But none of us are ever going to do that. Uh, all we can do is learn from these post-fire environments and from you know the ability that like the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety's large lab is capable of, of providing where we can you know build buildings and, and test uh, their exposure um, with different components components under an ember load, for example. So given that, uh, I also want to bring forward kind of this neighborhood and density effect. And I can see some of the chat questions are already coming to this, this conversation point. So, you know, what we saw is that the number of destroyed structures within 100 meters and the distance to the nearest destroyed structure were really the strongest predictors in home survival. And I think intuitively that really makes sense. I mean, uh, the closer the heat source is, the closer the flame source is, uh, that really matters. 
Um, and so what we've done is, you know, communicated this to our policy team um, to really reflect that radiant heat is important. And we know that Chapter 7A is, is moving to address that uh, it, to some degree. Um, but, you know, I think the other component is that building performance and building materials themselves um, have long service lives. Uh, and as we have been moving towards the newer constructed homes, you know, the roof is still in a period of reasonable performance. Um, you know, roofs are rated in 20, 30, and 40 year timeframes. Um, and so we were, you know, where we had the greatest uh, survival rate were in roofs, were in buildings that were less than 20 years old. So that's well within the period of performance for that roof. Uh, it's also now standard practice to have double pane windows. Um, so, you know, there are some just basic practice considerations that are making a difference. Um, that being said, you know, materials have different um, considerations, double, not just double pane, because that's a, typically an annealed window, but um, uh, tempered glass windows perform much better. They have three times the resistive properties to heat than a single, than a annealed glass does. Um, so, you know, product does matter. But within that, you know, think about maintenance and everybody's maintenance standards are different. And so that has an interaction effect, which we can't study in this, in this project. Extrapolating Paradise's condition to other locations, I, you know, I'll just want to put some, some sideboards on that. Uh, this is really a low density community. These are larger lot sizes. The average lot size in the older homes is three quarters of an acre and the newer construction time period is 1.25 acres. Uh, so there is, it's really relatively low density um, by many California standards and many uh, Western standards. Um, so, you know, we're going to talk more in the questions about density and I think, um, Density can become an issue if you get ignition in dense neighborhoods. There's more, um, there's you know less separation and greater issues to to address. Now, um, you know we found this 18 meter or 54 foot uh, separation between structures as being a determinant, and I'll just share that that is um, similar to a couple other fires where there's been some post fire analysis, such as the Witch Fire and the Waldo Canyon Fire and the Black Bear Cub Fire. So you know I think there's something to think about in that space. Um, there's some new structure separation research that's going on through NIST and through the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety can, that can give some more refinement on that, but you know, it's, it's, I think it's a mental note. Do I think it's a policy um, approach? I don't think we're quite ready to go that far, um, but it's you know something to be um, aware of. Next slide. So, you know, in conclusion, there's really reason for hope in this. Um, there's a lot of good statistical evidence pointing towards achievable actions. Let's take a moment and breathe about that. Like, you know, there is a pathway forward through this mess of wildfire and building survival that um, I think that many of us can achieve without huge investments. Critical to that is sort of understanding the exposure that a building will uh, likely have and then designing the, the both the fuel modification and the home hardening to specifically mitigate and address those issues. There are a lot of new building materials that are coming online. Um, there are vents that are specifically designed to resist both embers and flame exposure. Um, so there's some um, products that I think will be helpful in this space. And all of that in combination with good understandings, maintenance, um, and good installation, I think will make a big difference. So, you know, when we look towards other natural disasters, um, such as earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes, you know, what do we do in that space? Well, we don't try and fight them. What we do is we adapt and build smarter. So let's, you know, I think as a collective group, try and think about how we can apply that um, to fire and, and, you know, employ the best available science and management and practice to be able to put our buildings in a much more resilient condition so that we can become much more fire adapted. In California, we're working hard to try and figure out what the incentive systems need to be to help upgrade existing homes. Um, and you know, we know we can make changes respective to new construction, but there are 10 million existing single family homes in California. So we've got a lot of work to do, um, but I think we have a, now a pathway forward through that quagmire and uh, can give us some, um, I think more definitive choices that can be made um, for all of us. And you know, just wrapping it up, right? You know, when you look at these three types of exposures, there are different actions to take in each of these situations. So the direct flame contact issue, defensible space is really important for interrupting the fire pathway. 
Embers are um, addressed in both home hardening and defensible space to, to manage the, to the exposure issues. And then, you know, radiant heat, there are specific elements like the windows themselves uh, being upgraded to uh, tempered glass where you've got the potential for radiant heat exposures on like that particular side where that shed is, uh, as well as fuel reduction to uh, address potential exposure issues. And with that, we just want to thank all the folks that came together to help us in this project and uh, Celeste Abbott, who works with Eric, uh, Zeke Lunder from Deer Creek Resources, and then all the folks that contributed to the DINs data set and Nick Wallingford for, for helping us out in, in these issues. And we'll close with some images of, you know, what paradise looks like today. And you can see lots of this uh, kind of information being deployed, both in policy and practice and uh, changes are underfoot. So, you know, we just saw last week the first uh, certified wildfire prepared home um, get uh, approved and um, you know we're I think we're turning the corner in terms of how we think about these issues so thank you for your time and look forward to your questions thank you so much Eric and Yana and uh, folks just a quick reminder that uh, we ask that you put your questions into the q and a it should be a button on your zoom toolbar uh, rather than in the chat um, the, and I think there's a quick question that we can squeeze in here because you just showed the slide of the three types of uh, fire um, impact to the home. And, and one of the questions is, is convection uh, a flame spread mechanism that has to be considered here? Um, and, and maybe it's, we're sort of <laughs> identifying what is the situation where a house actually potentially experiences uh, convective flame impact? Eric, do you want to take a shot at that? Uh, wh why don't Why don't you, Yana? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I guess I, I'd I'd like more of a conversation around around that piece. Um, you know, there's I mean, there's just there's a lot to this, right? <laughs> um, and there's 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 lots of issues in this, but I think from the simple framing, we're we're hanging in the in the three types of exposure perspectives. Well, and, and maybe, I guess, um, I personally always think of convective flame spread as really only being an issue in areas where we have a lot of steep hillsides, where you have houses built on the high side, hillsides with a deck overhanging, and you've got flames coming up from, from below. And, and it looks from your pictures like the vast majority of houses that you showed, um, and potentially in paradise, are, are not in that type of topography. Um, and... And is there, a, you know, do you have any sort of sense of um, what proportion of the houses in this study um, right. were actually, you know, potentially impacted by convective uh, flame movement? No, it's really hard to determine that. But like you say, it's like the, the pictures point to other sources of vulnerability, you know, not to say that it didn't occur. I, I'm sure it did in some instances. Yeah. Paradise is relatively gentle in slope. Like I think it's got an 8% average slope across the properties that we looked at. The funny part about Paradise though is you it's on a plateau. So you've got you've got canyons and you've got, you know, rapid um, spread coming up those canyons and then punching over the top of the canyons and, and hitting homes at the top of that. We just saw that uh, just a couple of weeks ago in Malibu with the Malibu uh, fire, sometimes known as the mansion fire or the coast fire where you, you saw a lot of that. Um, it, but, you know, again, we're not, we're not extrapolating beyond paradise in this, in this project here. Um, so, you know, be thoughtful in that space. A couple of the questions here um, are getting at this issue of defensive actions. And, you know, we talk about defensible space a lot. And I think people often forget that um, literally the definition of defensible space is a person can stand there and defend the house, right? That's what we actually mean by defensible space. Um, and, and so, you know, there's this sort of question about, well, are we, are we underestimating uh, how many houses were potentially defended on the campfire? And, and you know, if simply there really wasn't um, any defensive action whatsoever, does that just 
put to bed the notion that we should have defensible space at all. Um, and, and maybe for folks that are um, not as familiar with the campfire uh, directly or, or that have, um, you know, are, are from uh, other states or, or whatnot, um, it may be part of answering this question about the value of defensible space and, and why there wasn't much defensive action here. Um, maybe part of it is actually explaining how anomalous the campfire actually was um, compared to a lot of the other fires where we have seen structure loss in recent years. Yeah, that's exactly true, Crystal. I mean, one of the points I made earlier in the presentation is there was like five mile wide fire front when it hit paradise. And I think that is partly what made defensive action so difficult because, um, you know, from, from what I've read is uh, the, a lot of the, the resources that responded were just trying to get people out and save lives. And so the effort wasn't wasn't put on a defensive action like it might be in a lot of other fires and a lot of uh, the rest of the literature. I mean, there's estimates of you know, you know 30, 40, 50 percent of homes in some of these types of analyses have, having experienced defensive action in the DINs data for the, for the campfire. I think there was something like seven out of the 400 homes that we that ended up in our sample uh, had notes that defensive action was taken. So that's, you know, 2%. And then we did a lot of interviews with CAL FIRE personnel um, to validate that statement that there was relatively little defensive action. Um, you know, I've just, I've heard so many talks about you know, where the priority and the focus was. That being said, I wasn't there, it's true. So I, you know, <laughs> there could be some that, that had some actions at least temporarily. Um, but, you know, I think just scaling up, like I recently looked at um, the Boulder fire uh, that happened, the Marshall fire in Colorado, and, and where we saw the difference between um, the, where the fire stopped, where the lines were between um, destroyed and survived. In every case, we had defensive action in those locations. Um, I did not see but maybe one example of a home that survived on its own. Um, so, you know, it's our firefighter team is a really important part of this, of our whole strategy around managing wildfire. Um, you know, and this question, you know, this study is really looking at like, well, what would happen if you don't have those available resources? And, and I guess I've moved to that place philosophically and that I'm going to assume that when we have the conflagration of this scale, that resources should be going to keeping people out of harm's way and less about protecting structures. So what can I do to put my structure, my community structures in the best possible position? so that they can defend on their own and the focus can be on getting people out of the way. Great, great way to wrap up there, Yana. Um, and I, I have to apologize. I completely botched Yana's last name <laughs> at the beginning of this seminar is Yana Balakovic. Uh, and it's, I, I am so sorry about that. I, I'm sensitive to people botching names because it happens to me all the time too so <laughs> um folks it is past three o'clock so i so apologize there's a lot of great questions um in in the q a we thank you for those uh but we do need to to wrap up uh and thank you so much to eric knapp and yana Velakovic for giving us our talk today that was a great overview of their important work on the campfire so much to be learned um and you know i really appreciate uh, how this all fits into this larger progression on uh, our building codes and how we can move towards building these communities uh, that will actually be able to, to survive into the future. So thank you both. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, Stacy, I know you're out there somewhere. I have no idea when our next seminar is because I'm brain dead and forgot to actually look ahead of time. <laughs> I don't know if you can pop on and say, this is what it is. No. I see. Okay. Maybe Stacy can't pop on. That's okay. <laughs> All right. Well, you'll, you'll get an email from, uh, from Stacy and, and the, uh, the email list when our next seminar is up. Uh, we hope to see you then. Thank you so much, everyone, for your attendance today and for the great questions and for our great presenters. Have a great rest of your day and uh, welcome to almost July. <laughs> everyone stay safe. Bye-bye.